Hello, if you follow the channel, you have seen the HP 9025 calculator from the 1970s doing cameo appearances here and there during the Apollo Guidance Computer Restoration or the HP Tape Salad extravaganza. It makes for a great period HPIB instrument controller, which I like to use to remote control the HP power supplies doing our restorations, for example. I wanted to add a clock module to use in fancy real-time test applications, like our infamous fancy pens dude in the HP catalog. But none of the clock modules I acquired ever worked. I amassed no less than six of them, with zero successes after attempting simple repairs. That is, until I decided to take the bull by the horns and repair them all in what turned out to be a five-episode repair-a-thon. The repairs turned out to be quite an entertaining drama, with release of magic smoke, use of vinegar for non-culinary purposes, and recreation of early Texas Instruments LED watches. But in the last episode we prevailed and successfully repaired the last of my six modules. Alright, so now that I can claim to be probably the one with the most uh, clock interfaces working in the world, uh, what do we want to do with it? Well, we want to play like Mr. Fancy Pants, right? And wait for it before we do it. We have to wear the Fancy Pants. So they came back. It's <laughs> available on my, on my store, it's, uh, my Teespring store. It started as a joke with some of the commenters that wanted to see where to buy the fancy pants. And here they are, the magic vintage repair pants. And that's on your butt, the front is okay. And it says, repairing, repairs any vintage electronics guaranteed. With a little curious smart logo. Those actually turned out super nice. I'm very surprised. This is, I don't know what, how they print it, but it's much, much better than what they do on the t-shirts. And uh, the interior is super soft. And the, the, the detail on it is incredible. So let's go wear that. And from then on, we'll have only success. Okay, fancy pants are on. No vintage electronics can resist me anymore. We are ready to do some serious work. And before we start, it's important to understand that this module was quite amazing for its time because it's not only a clock like this one is supposed to replace, but it's also a timing generator. So actually, this replaces these two boxes that were available before and where you know, our HPIB boxes they are meant to work together. These are actually little hooks on the side of each. And here you go, you can make them play nicely together. So we'll look uh, not only at the clock functions, which are pretty straightforward, but uh, a lot at the timing functions. There's uh, four timers with uh, four inputs and eight outputs in that little thing. And similarly, the HP 9825 is not your average 1970s calculator either. It is excessively well built and is powered by a proprietary HP NMOS 16-bit multi-chip on ceramic processor. Two very similar processors were used in the famed HP 9845 workstation. So I have one of the clock modules plugged at the back of the 9825 and of course you can do what you expect which is uh, read the clock and it will give you the date and the time and if you read it continuously, it will just update. So that's the normal uh, clock function. But as I just told you, this unit has also many timers in it. And one of the fun use of the timers is to time uh, the operations of the computer. Uh, and let's load a program that calculates prime numbers, for example. This is going to calculate the first 500 um, prime numbers. And it, it's kind of slow because I'm going to stop it actually. It's kind of slow because it spends its time printing. So I have the same program uh, that does the 5000 prime numbers. It's program 2. Load it from the tape. And we'll run it. 
and it doesn't print it it's just on the display and it starts kind of slow because it's it's a uh, uh, it's a sieve process so it, first it takes a long time and it goes fast 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 and faster and it will go up to uh, 5000 which is the max you can do on, on that machine because of memory so here uh, now imagine you want to know exactly how long that takes well you could take your uh, chronometer but you can use one of the timers on the clock module so I have the same program program number four on the tape it makes the use of the timer in the clock module let's see if we can show you how that works so what the scripted line says is write to interface 9 which happens to be the clock module so on, on the module you have a, a little arrow that, that you can turn and change the address and the default is 9 so I left it there and then you send it the scripted string and this is to set uh, one of the four counters in this case unit 2 u2 uh, as an input counter so before you can do it you have to halt it so it's u2h is u2 halt then you define it as the input counter 1 and then you start at u2 go and then just before starting your program you send it a u2 clear so sets the counter at 0 and then that's my program that calculates the 5,000 uh, prime numbers. It's not very long, and that's uh, it's, it's like a few lines long. And now I am going to send it a U2V, which is value of U2, and read it back into variable T, and then display it. I'll display T. So here we go. We run the whole thing. And the counter has started in the clock. It's counting in milliseconds. So this, the all the resolution of the clock is in millisecond steps. And off we go. So it took 23 seconds and 146 milliseconds. And you can use that to time programs or measurements. So another use of the counter is to generate regular interrupts to uh, interrupt your program and maybe take a measurement. So pretty much what this little guy uh, was doing here, the timing generator. And here I have a program that does that. It interrupts the uh, calculator every second and will have a beep. And it's very simple. So if I go, so the first uh, line I declare an interrupt routine so on, on interrupt 9 coming from the clock module go to the routine beep and then I just EIRR is enable interrupts and then here is another of those cryptic uh, setting lines I halt a few units uh, I'm going to use U1 for this time uh, set it as an output which is also generating interrupts and I set the period to a thousand milliseconds, so every second. And then I tell it to go, U1G. So I just take that to start. And then I do a, a single line loop here. I'm just incrementing a number, displaying it, and going back to the same line. And it's going to interrupt that count every second. Go to the interrupt handler named beep, which is just going to beep and then uh, reinstate the interrupt and return. So if we run that, we have our program running and every second is getting interrupted. Usually that would be for taking a measurement. And you don't just have one counter at your disposal, you have four. So here's the same improved program where I enable interrupts, but this time I um, still have my old unit, but I'm going to add another one. I'm going to use a unit 2, and this time it's at 2.1 seconds intervals. And same loop, incrementing the number. Uh, now the interrupt routine is a little bit more complicated because I have to check uh, which counter interrupts it, so I have to ask it for uh, which counter did that and I do a bit tests if it's 
counter 1, I just do one beep. If it's counter 2, I do two beeps and uh, I have to put a little wait statement which is not a good thing to do in, in, in an interrupt routine because it hangs up the machine basically so when it does a two beep you see the count stutter a little bit uh, for simplicity that's what I chose to do so let's run it and you'll hear the second the, the double beeps at a completely different uh, period than the first one so you can have up to four completely different periods to generate interrupts not bad for a small calculator so next we are going to use even more functionality of this module so at the back you, you've noted that there's a little plug and you, you can kind of pop it off and inside there's a connector we haven't talked about it yet but at the back of the module on the clock board there is this connector here and normally it has this grounding shroud on top of it which uh, grounds all the inputs I can put it back together but there is actually a little outlet so on the interfaces that don't have the cable it's plugged we can pop the plug out and put your own cable and that will give you four inputs four outputs and a bunch of grounds um, you could order this module with option 100 which would give you a nice beautiful cable made by HP but I, I made my own and I have it hooked up back there and what this thing does it gives you input and outputs and this is to mimic this instrument so right now for example I have the older instrument here generate uh, at least to, to the 10 to the third so it's 10 milliseconds and you can see them on the scope actually they are hard to see because they are smack over the line of the scope uh, make them a little, a little closer together but if you look at them it's a look at that this is a HP quality pulse it's it's an ECL device so it's very fast so it's a 500 nanosecond pulse every 10 microseconds so this is really very convenient here right now it's set at you know, 10 microseconds but you could do oh, 10 milliseconds but you, you could do 24 and it jumps right to it and it's it's fairly precise so let's put it back to 10 and now we're going to try to do the same thing with my little interface so back there I have taken one of the output lines and I brought it to the scope on the green trace it's on the green trace and right now I have only the older instrument doing the yellow trace and I've loaded a program and it's very simple so one liner so it's this single line this time I'm going to use the unit 3 set it on uh, the output line 3 there's four of them that you can choose and uh, generate a 10 millisecond uh, pulse train. Uh, one, two, three, I hit run. There you go. And you see the pulses. Um, I still have the, the, the box version of it. Now they are both at 10 milliseconds. And let's actually trigger on the other one. There you go. And it was the same idea really as, as the box it replaces gives you a sharp pulse it's it's longer this one is uh, but four actually exactly four microseconds long and uh, actually let's see how precise that is I calibrated it recently so it should be good I calibrated all the interfaces actually and we have Nine 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 point five zero. So not too bad. And uh, if I want to change it for, for example, fifteen, it's a simple change over here. 
put the five, store it. Okay, one, two, run. Nope. And it switched to 15 milliseconds. 14.999999. So, same thing, you have four timers. So basically you could do four train of pulses uh, totally independently. And now for the grand finale, we are going to use the inputs of which we also have four. And for that, I hooked it up to this very fancy switch which is actually an Apollo era switch that they use in uh, on the ground control stations. By the way, friend Blanche just released a delightful video about this iconic over-engineered Apollo switches that were used in the mission control consoles. They are high reliability, infinitely configurable, avionic lighted switches. They had a sea of them in the mocker, continuously flickering about. Nothing was more beautiful than them. Err. Almost. Once I saw Fran's video, I knew I had to have one. I'll link her video in the doodle leaf. That's some monster switching. And you know, instead of having regular stuff at the back, it uses micro switches of all things. And to take them apart, I'm glad friend an episode on it, I wouldn't found out. You take them like this, you turn them a quarter turn, and here they come and you can insert the little lamps. And know that m mine are blue and I thought I would get blue light, but not at all. It's just to make the, the lights less yellow, so it comes actually white when you put it back together. I'll show you a second. It's there to make the incandescent light appear white. <laughs> okay, so we'll wire it up. Okay, we have a test button. By the way, they recently restored the mission control, but horrors of horrors, they use LCD screens instead of CRTs. I guess they had to make concession to practicality and cost, but as a museum artifact restorer, I am quite offended by that. However, it looks like they just used the correct switches. Here's one just like mine being reseated or replaced. So here we go, we'll measure our fancy switch, actually the time it's pressed down using the clock module. And the programming is more of the same. Uh, at this time I use unit four, I set it up uh, to read the input line four, and uh, you'll guess what will happen. So it waits for me to press the switch, Click. And then it's going to measure the time until I press it a second time. And I press it exactly for 4 seconds and 666 milliseconds. And it is such a great switch. You could, you could switch in and out all day. And this one was more like 3 seconds. So, uh, I think you get the idea. It's, it's a pretty nifty box uh, with... Uh, lot more than a clock on it and partly for the time when it replaced much larger boxes uh, so th I hope you enjoyed the, the repair thon and uh, playing with the, the fancy clock modules and uh, don't forget to use your uh, magic repair pants if you do vintage electronics and see you in the next episode what's the fastest I can do it it's, it's a heavy switch Two hundred and forty something milliseconds. I should have used a push button. That would have been much better.